Welcome back for part 5 of the Lady Dragon. Without further ado, let's continue the story. Everyone is surprised to see Zealot and Karina as they were ready to fight them again. Lee tells them that the war is over and is confused as to why they are still being chased by them. Zealot responds that he never had an interest in wars between petty countries. Of course, Lee doesn't accept that. In anger, she tells him that because of the war, thousands have lost their lives as she shouts angrily at Zealot. Zealot responds by questioning her mockingly, saying that she's a knight who makes a living from war and yet she is blaming him for it. But Lee doesn't say anything. As he unsheathes his sword, he tells Lee to unsheathe her weapon as he wants to end their fight once and for all. Carnelian intervenes, trying to stop the fight. However, Zelid tells her that she has her own opponent as well. Karina begins to attack seriously, but Lee manages to dodge it. Of course, our girl doesn't accept it as she still gets hit. Suddenly, Karina goes on the attack, kicking Carnelian and knocking her back hard. The blow is so powerful that Carnelian crashes through the walls, breaking them. Meanwhile, Chen is surprised and worried about Carnelian. Karina approaches Carnelian, who taunts her by asking if she wants to die that badly. However, Karina is not affected by Carnelian's words as she rushes towards her with killing intent. Meanwhile, Zelid and Lee face each other without any distractions. Ike Ates protects her master as Zelid points his weapon at them. This, of course, mocks Lee, who questions Zelid about his so-called puppet, daring him to leave. Lee doesn't accept what Zelid said and tells him that Ike Ates is not a puppet. She then commands Ike Ates to protect Chen and insists that she must be the one to end their fight. We can see that he doesn't want to leave her side, but due to the contract, he simply accepts it as it is. Now, Lee is facing him, and still, Zelid tries to mock her, underestimating her by asking if she's going to fight alone and shouldn't be so laid back. Lee responds by questioning him about all those years, asking if he was planning something all along. Zelid responds that he just couldn't bear to watch her playing as a knight. Zelid is now about to attack Lee as he readies his sword, but she manages to block it, struggling with the strength of the strike. While struggling, Zelid threatens her, saying that today she will die by his hands. We go back to our girl, who is also struggling to block Karina's attacks. She blocks and dodges, but Karina is far more powerful and relentless in her attacks. Soon enough, Karina unleashes another powerful blow, knocking Carnelian back once again. Afterwards, she notices how serious Karina is, curious about her relentless attacks. She asks Karina why she's so hung up over something from ages ago. Karina angrily responds, questioning our girl if she has realized what she did. As she recalls her actions, this only angers Karina more, prompting her to rush in for another attack. Now, we return to Zelid and Lee as they both fight seriously. Lee struggles a lot as she has gotten weaker due to the poison she received, but that doesn't stop her as she gives her best to defend herself. Chen and Ikates observe this and ask each other why Zelid is behaving that way. Ikates explains that knights typically bear arms for the sake of their country, or family, but Zelid is an expelled knight who acts only for himself. This revelation silences Chen as he recalls the time when Li told him that he seemed different from other knights. She mentioned that he seemed unbound by anything and could choose his own path to walk. He remembers her confessing that she felt embarrassed about herself, using the title of royal knight as an excuse to be inattentive to her training. Chen then recalls Zelid's earlier words about how he couldn't bear to watch Li play as a knight and his threat that Li would die by his hand today. Now, Chen wonders what Zelid possibly wants. Meanwhile, we can see that Li is exhausted while Zelid doesn't sweat and tells her that an Arroyo knight who can barely stand against an expelled knight is a waste of the title of Azure Raptor. Without any hesitation, Zelid rushes in for another attack but is blocked again by Li. He smiles, seeing Li struggle so hard to stay alive. Eventually, Zelid manages to disarm Li's weapon, causing her to kneel at his feet. As Zelid points his sword at her throat, he states that Knight Li Dietrich is no more. Just as he begins to chop off her head, Li accepts her death. Suddenly, Ikates can't take it any longer and disarms Zelid's sword, surprising them both. Li is dumbfounded as she asks him how he broke her order. He responds that the seals exist to protect their master no matter what. Of course, this angers Zelid, and he shouts angrily at Ikates, rushing to punch him. However, Ikates blocks the attack with his own barrier. Surprisingly, Ikates struggles as Zelid, a strong knight, tries his best to break through. Eventually, Zelid breaks through Ikates' barrier, knocking him off and sending him flying. Although Ikates was a hindrance to him, Zelid decides not to kill him as he finds him admirable. However, he tells him that he still needs to pay for making a scene when Zelid was about to harm him. Lee rushes to save Ikates, causing Zelid to back away. Lee tells Zelid that they are still not done yet and asks him not to drag the others into it. She is ready to fight him again. 
However, Zelid just snickers and begins to laugh loudly, stating that he now finally sees a familiar face. With that, he puts back his sword and tells her that he sees the human Lee hidden away by the facade of a knight. Surprisingly, Zelid walks away. Meanwhile, Chen forgets about Carnelian and is shocked to see her defeated as she kneels down to Karina. Disappointed, Karina questions Carnelian, saying that it seems she can't even wake up Mistral. She suggests that calling this revenge wouldn't even be fitting. Karina readies his fist, telling our girl to die. With a serious look on her face, she is ready to kill our hero. As Karina strikes her attack, Carnelian manages to dodge and backs away. Once she's at a safe distance, she asks Karina about the past and why it's her fault that her master died. Furious, Karina recalls the time when her master died. She remembers that Carnelian, or Garang at that time, killed Karina's previous master, which made Karina go berserk with heartbreak. She recalls making her kill everyone she loved with her own hands because she was out of control due to heartbreak. Now, Karina tells Carnelian that she has the audacity to tell herself that it's not her fault. She shouts at our girl as Carnelian weakly stands up and responds that everything was Karina's fault. She explains that she despaired from her master's death and is in misery because she killed her master's family. Carnelian screams with frustration, telling Karina that those are all consequences of loving a human despite being a seal. Chen hears this and is surprised. Zealot also hears it and tells Chen that a higher-ranking seal having an unfit master can't even use half of its strength. This confuses our boy, and Zealot then asks Chen if he is not aware that the strength of the seals depends on the capabilities of their master. Following that, he tells Chen that he is killing his seal, Carnelian. With that, Chen begins to remember what Carnelian said about how a cook like him shouldn't have woken her up. Moreover, he recalls the time when Carnelian told him to become a knight and transfer her to a different knight with lots of money and skills. This makes him ponder her words. She always complained about his weakness, but she never told him that he is the one causing her weakness. Zelid then walks away, ordering Karina to stop and go. However, Karina really wanted to kill Carnelian. Seeing her reaction, Zelid looks at Karina with a stern expression and understands that she needs to follow his orders. With a look of defeat, Karina shakes with disappointment as she failed to kill Carnelian. Zelid then looks back at Lee and tells her that it's not worth killing someone who is still entangled with their past, surprising Lee with his words. As he moves back, he tells Karina that the seal, or Carnelian, is not at fault, but rather it's the master's incompetence. With that, the two of them go away, leaving everyone alive. Chen then sees Carnelian's state and asks if she's okay. Carnelian smiles with relief and tells him that she's not okay, that she almost died on the spot. Furthermore, she tells Chen that she couldn't even protect her own master, finding it laughable. Chen knows that it was truly his fault, that because of his weakness, but Carnelian insists on what Zelid said, implying that Chen did not pay heed to his words. Teamers don't have to feel bad whether they kill or sell them. Seals are born for that purpose, to be slaves to the master. Carnelian, feeling relieved, asks Chen to take her home as she's exhausted. Meanwhile, Li sees a bottle on the floor. As she picks it up, she realizes it's an antidote, a cure for poison, knowing that it came from Zelid. Carnelian then asks if Lee is okay, startling her. Lee apologizes for getting them wrapped up in their situation, but Carnelian tells her not to worry about it, as they're just glad she is fine. Chen then asks if Zelid came barging in and disappeared without a trace, wondering what he was truly planning. For a moment, Lee is silent on that question, and she begins to wonder herself what Zelid wants from her and why he came to her. Hours passed by, and our two heroes finally returned home, exhausted from their ordeal. Chen asks Carnelian if Lee will be okay, considering they were injured so severely yet still rushed to the castle immediately. Carnelian responds that it's part of a knight's principles and dedication. Chen wonders if they should also go, to which Carnelian tells him that they should. She doubts that the king would only use words to thank them. However, she bets that there are a few shiny and expensive things awaiting them, which prompts Lee to think about gold and money. Then, Chen wants to ask her something. During her fight with Karina, he heard her mentioning someone named Garong her previous name. This makes Carnelian visibly shaken, indicating she doesn't want to remember her past or her previous name. Chen is scared by her reaction, and Carnelian then asks him if he remembers the concept of privacy they talked about before in the forest. Chen admits he doesn't know what it is, as he wonders if it's some kind of magic spell or something similar. She reminds Chen that it's a spell preventing others from invading her private matters, and she's currently under its effect, asking him to stop asking questions about her past. 
With that, Chen now remembers it's a spell she casted, inflicted upon her. Carnelian explains to Chen that she can't tell him about the story of her previous master. Chen understands and doesn't want to talk about it. Both of them are tired as it's getting late and decide to go to bed. However, Carnelian insists that Chen should rest early tonight. She tells him that if her previous memory serves her right, the journey tomorrow will be quite arduous. Chen understands and agrees to go to bed early as she requested. As he walks away, Carnelian can't help but remember what Chen said earlier, and starts to reminisce about her past. Here, we see Carnelian's past. She looks emotionless, mixed with sadness, remembering her master who looked like an angel with six wings, telling her to come to his side. The next morning at Hesfarkin Castle, a messenger announces that the royal order of the Offenbox Emperor, the Red-Eyed Seal, has awoken and commands to bring that seal alive, stating they are currently at Risenberg. The king, named Hopman III, Hesfarkin's emperor, begins to speak to a powerful knight, informing them that while she is overqualified for the task, the seal is precious to the first emperor, and they mustn't fail the mission. The knight vows to the king, stating, I, Said von Russell, accept the emperor's command, and begins to walk away to find our two heroes. As he walks away towards the throne, we can see two children who are not normal humans, but seals, named Juliet and Justin. Their master, a strong knight with blonde hair who looks menacing, is named Said von Russell, the Lichtjäger's High Knight. Our two heroes decided to leave Risenberg as they walked through a deserted place. While walking, our girl noticed that Chen seemed quite quiet, and she pondered what was bothering him, as he was unusually quiet. She recalled the last time when Chen asked about her name, and maybe that's what he was thinking about. She remembered her words that she couldn't tell him about the story of her previous master. Now, she wondered if she had been too harsh towards Chen. Suddenly, Chen spoke to Carnelian, surprising her. It turned out he had been quiet because he was tired and drained, and he wanted some water. This shocked Carnelian, and she misunderstood. Since he was born in a cold place, with a weakened voice, he asked Carnelian if she was sure there was a village somewhere out of nowhere. Indeed, there was, as Carnelian tried to reassure Chen that they were very close to the place. Chen felt relieved that they reached the village. While walking on the way to the inn, they heard someone calling for them, and they saw a silhouette in the corner. It was revealed to be a little village boy named Rasperge. The little boy told them that they had to pay a toll to enter the village. If they didn't have any money, they would have to give up their swords as payment instead. Of course, Carnelian just laughed while Chen couldn't take the heat anymore. Carnelian expressed joy toward the young boy, thinking she was going to die from laughter. But the little boy was serious and told them that he is the knight favored by the Azure Raptor, Dame Lee. This made our girl laugh a lot, thinking what a brave child he was, and she even teased Chen that he should learn from the kid. Amused by the young boy, our girl approached him and told him that no matter how tough the world is, a child who hasn't undergone the coming-of-age ceremony can't become a knight. However, she warned him that if he insisted on lying, pointing at Chen, she would reprimand him. The young boy, upon hearing that Chen is a knight, shimmered with excitement and astonishment towards our two heroes. He quickly went to Chen and asked if he was truly a knight, begging him to help him with his training. He was so eager, telling Chen that he wanted to become strong because he had someone he needed to protect, with a serious look on his face. Later on, after they got their room in a local inn, Carnelian couldn't help but recall what happened earlier, mentioning to Chen that she didn't expect him to reject the boy like that. Chen had refused to help the little boy, explaining that he wasn't a knight. Remembering how serious the boy seemed, Chen couldn't lie to him, realizing that he wouldn't pretend to be a knight anymore. He knew that becoming a knight required more than just a few words, and besides, being a cook wasn't a bad thing either. Chen noticed they had a nice room, likely in return for cooking the next day. Carnelian still remembered what Chen said to the little boy, but Chen reassured her that everything would be okay. He believed that once the boy's father, who was a knight, returned, he could receive proper training from him. Carnelian responded, telling Chen that he was truly oblivious. She explained that there are no proper knights among those who merely proclaim themselves as such, and it's unfortunate for the kid because he probably wouldn't see his father ever again. This realization made Chen a little sad as he thought about it. Then, Carnelian had an idea to pass the time, suggesting they go downstairs and have drinks. However, Chen admitted that he had never drunk before. Carnelian started to tease Chen, saying that if she served a young master, then she would just drink alone. This prompted Chen to put up a challenge, hearing her words confidently asserting that he could drink with no problem at all. The two of them went downstairs to drink. From Chen's perspective, he felt dizzy, wondering why the world was spinning. Carnelian reassured him that it was something else that was spinning. Here, we see Chen becoming drunk after just a small drink and slumping down to rest. 
Carnelian was proud that even with just one sip, Chen was in that state, thinking about how weak his master was. Our drunken boy agreed that he was weak and apologized for it as he dozed off, promising that he would find a proper night for Carnelian. Suddenly, a drunken man approached them, seeing that Chen was out cold, and started flirting with Carnelian. However, she wouldn't have any of it, telling him to go fuck off. But that didn't deter the drunken man. He was amused by her harsh words. He attempted to seduce her, asking if they could hang out and keep each other company for the whole night. As he was about to touch Carnelian, she drew her blade, preparing for a fight. This made the man back away. Walking away, he remarked that she surely had days when she wanted to be alone, allowing her to enjoy her time alone while she could, laughing suspiciously. Carnelian sighed and stated that nothing ever changes, whether in the past or in the present, pointing out that she was either from the future or the past. Meanwhile, a fat man was staring straight at her. She noticed him but tried to play it cool, now wondering if she was being too oversensitive due to drinking, while the man presented the pride of their shop. As he introduced the singer or harp player in their inn, named Merquent, our girl noticed that the elf was bought from the slave market, as she saw him locked by chains. The elf then started to sing and play the harp, performing a very beautiful sad song. All the guests or customers listened as he sang his song. Meanwhile, Chen cried at how beautiful the sound was and how the song was so tragic. Carnelian heard this and told Chen that elves in the hands of humans can only sing sad songs, like birds in a cage who sing softly. Meanwhile, at Risenberg Castle, there we can see Ikates and Lee meeting with the king as they were summoned by him. The king told them that the ball would take place soon, and many important personnel would be attending. Lee understood this and told the king that she would ensure security. However, the king told them that they were invited to the ball as well, asking Lee to get herself addressed and meet with the other nobles. By the looks of it, we can see Lee feeling uncomfortable about it. The king continued to tell her that he had seen her from her youth, and that it's good to work hard, but it's also important to meet good people and start a family. In her mind, she hoped that Chen and Carnelian were having a safe journey, but she couldn't even provide them with a carriage due to the situation. The king noticed that Lee was lost in thought and asked if she was listening. Startled, Lee apologized. The king then said to let him know if she had anyone in mind, and he would use his connections to make it happen. However, by the looks of Lee, it seemed like something bad was going to happen. Lastly, we can see Zealot and Karina traveling as well. Karina asked Zealot if they thought they would invite those who attacked their country to the ball. Zealot responded that he was sure they wouldn't welcome them but they also couldn't simply kick them out. Now, Karina felt that something bad was going to happen, knowing that Lee would attack them on sight. With sadness in Zelid's voice, he tells Karina that if such a situation were to occur, he hoped that she could see her up close, and he wouldn't mind. And with that, I conclude this episode. Now, what will happen next? What will happen to Carnelian and Chen after encountering some suspicious people in that inn? Will they ever help the young villager? Lastly, why were Zelid and Karina invited to that ball? Tune in next time for the next part of this series. As always, thank you for your support and make sure to subscribe. Thank you for watching.